So our presenter this evening is Imran Siddiqui uh, from the Wildlife Conservation Society. He's a conservationist better known for his work on con tiger conservation in the two Telugu states of India. An award-winning conservationist, Imran completed his master's in wildlife biology and conservation in 2010 from WCS NCBS MSC program. He is better known for the formation of Kaval Tiger Reserve and for adding huge areas to existing tiger reserves. His team of 35 work in the tiger areas of Andhra and Telangana and support the forest departments in monitoring and ensuring their survival in India's largest tiger reserves and challenging landscapes. Imran also works closely with numerous tribal communities and helps them avail government schemes together with creating and sustaining political will for conservation and policy initiatives at the national level. Additionally, Imran plays a key role in school awareness programs, skill development of tribals, awareness creation and organizing communities into cooperatives to register for conservation campaigns and represents on many statutory committees like the State Board of Wildlife, Tiger Steering Committee, State and District Level Relocation Committees, Tiger Foundations and Human Wildlife Conflict Committees. Among his many awards, he has also won the prestigious Carl Zeiss Award in 2015 and the Wildlife Service Award from Sanctuary Asia in 2018. Imran. Where are you? I found my video also. <laughs> Where are you? There you are. Sorry, I had to read that out. There's a lot there. That's uh, amazing. Very impressive. Very busy, ma'am. Oh, really? Thank <laughs> thanks for a very generous introduction. And uh, thanks, uh, Coastal Impact, for uh, bringing me uh, to this and uh, inviting me for this. And I'm really gl glad that uh, if people are actually looking at, uh, you know, other uh, thing, uh, landscapes, terrestrial systems, also apart from the marine. Generally, uh, we tend to focus on what we work with, and uh, it's really good that you are actually expanding your horizon and scope. I think uh, I'll try to do my best to show why. I mean, I want to say more than what we do. It's like why we do what we do. So, the the theme which I have uh, selected is like why it is important to conserve. It's not just the tigers. Tigers, generally, uh, just before starting, Venkat and I were, uh, were having a discussion that tigers generally take the big bulk, you know, like uh, from conservation uh, money which comes for the legislations which are placed or for areas which are earmarked, uh, money which is spent. Tigers take a lot because they are charismatic, very charismatic species, and uh, they tend to be uh, very attractive and uh, but we are missing many other species which are along with tiger, which are probably equally important. We don't know how to assess. Um, we don't have enough tools or mechanisms to assess what is more important and what is less. And I think it's very unfair that other species don't get the same attention which tiger gets. But I think uh, tiger being tiger, it deserves it and it really enjoys it. I think um, it's doing well. Uh, in many of the tiger reserves. So I, I, I'm really glad that at least tiger is getting that kind of attention which other species also should have got. So this is a uh, photo which was taken in 1968, 24 December, night of the 24 December. This is called as Earth Rise. The, uh, this many of us may not have been there and uh, many of us may not know, but this photo really uh, changed the way we looked at our planet Earth. The Earth, first time we are seeing Earth from outside and all of a sudden it looks like a very small fragile piece of thing which is full of water. Uh, they, they called it blue marble. Uh, it was taken in 1968 and uh, there were uh, photos when they came out in 1969 and was published. It, it, it created some sort of environmental awareness, you know. Uh, I mean, the Earth all of a sudden looks like a spaceship Earth looks like something which is very unique 
and it is and uh, this was the only place where humans are known to exist still we have not found any other existence of life outside our planets uh, outside our uh, earth so if you see there is a thin halo halo around earth basically that is our biosphere that, that are the gases which is in the earth which is giving us life so th this uh, as it looks is very fragile system it has taken billions of years to evolve and what it is now and uh, we are doing it quite fast within few decades we are turning it around so if you see uh, the whole history of earth as a 24 hours uh, clock if you just put that in a single day uh, what we can relate to it's like homo sapiens appeared just in the last minute you know and the modern man is like just four seconds in this planet and we have managed to undo the evolution i mean we, we have triggered the la the biggest mass extinction which is now happening there was earlier also there were five mass extinctions but this is what something one single species is doing you may have uh, many theories of where the human came from either from the sky or from the earth or like born uh, came from um, apes so, but what science says is that we have taken uh, the moment we have arrived say when homos uh, have arrived from 60 to 65 uh, thousand years ago they have started colonizing the planet and it it is just the modern man is just say 10 to 35000 years old we have just small history in front of billions of years of earth history and yet we have managed to colonize the entire world and um, ever since we have got this industrial revolution happening we have managed to screw up the world like no one's business like we have completely so we say that uh, if you divide different epochs of Earth's history, we say that this is uh, no, it's largely being accepted that this is called as Anthropocene, which is uh, an epoch which is like completely ruining the Earth, and our footprint is seen all over the planet. So now uh, you see, they generally say that uh, 1950, also the year of industrial revolutions. I mean, when the world started looking up we got antibiotics to fight uh, the diseases which was spreading in the world and we, we we have this sudden explosion of populations all over the world and then sudden rise of carbon dioxide sudden temperature rises uh, loss of forests oceans are getting acidic and you see 1950s clearly is having a great impact and uh, the energy use is increasing, we are getting more and more, and this is happening as we grow. Um, um, as a nation, we are actually you know, managing to screw up the planet. If you see here the night vision, uh, 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 image of the night uh, of the earth, you see uh, the Europe's, you see India, like basically what it says that the luminous the light which is more means like uh, there's no forest down there there is no natural systems down there so still africa has some but while america is here it is drilling in africa while india is here it's drilling in africa china there is space for, for uh, extracting things from africa same for america uh, uh, south america the rest of the planet uh, the north in Siberia is maybe not habitable, but whichever is habitable has been taken over by humans and we are completely screwing up. If you look at our own country, India, uh, if you see, uh, this is not an image of the Diwali night, generally every Diwali, there will be a WhatsApp image, uh, WhatsApp thing circulating that, oh, this is what was happening. No, no, this is every day. So you can see these corridors, you can see uh, Delhi, we can see the growth around Delhi. Basically, it shows how big the areas are becoming. You see Pune, Mumbai. You see Hyderabad, Chennai, Bangor. Within entire thing, what I the moment I see this, what I tend to look at is these black spots. You know, actually, for me, these black spots are the bright spots of India because they are the things which are giving life to India. How I will get into details a little 
later now. But look at this image and see, like we have completely taken over the country and we have left very small places for nature to do its own services. We have spread all around India. We have more than 1.35 billion uh, and our cities are all choked thanks to coronavirus or like at the moment uh, looks like a little opening up of you know, city traffic, but still uh, this is a daily chaos, go whichever metro you or maybe. And this is what we aspire for. There's a book written by one of uh, the ministers uh, in the cabinet, India Aspires. It talks about how India wants to become a global country, I mean, a country of first world, which has malls, which has fast railways, which have waterways through the things. But yeah, I think we need somewhere, but uh, the rush which we are doing, trampling entire planet, uh, trampling our Indian uh, uh, natural systems is a complete madness. Globally, we have like uh, the biomass of the world uh, is like 60% of the world's biomass. If you measure is the livestock, 36% is human beings and just 4% is wildlife. Similar thing with the birds, 70% of the birds are our chickens and poultry um, and only 30% is the wild birds. So we have completely taken and this is happening as we are aspiring to make 5 trillion economy and we are at 3.2 trillion now and then we, we just want to increase and we have picked some uh, unusually high um, growth rates which we try to aspire like anything less than 8% of GDP is like bad it's like uh, not good and um, it has to be taken over so but who runs the country actually for the planet earth there is no government you know like uh, you may have this loose bodies like united nations where all representatives from entire planet comes and uh, uh, all the countries are representing there but we don't have one government like that there is something subtle there's something underground of what we see this is the planet earth which is run by the kingdom which is animal kingdom which is run by the systems which are evolved the halo which you see the gases which you have around the earth is because of the systems which are there of which plants play a major role but for the survival of plants we need bees so these bees play a very critical role in making fruits for the plants without bees we may not be able to survive not just bees, they are like 60,500 known species of insects which are doing tremendous service for India uh, within our country, which are like tremendously helping in various systems, uh, survival of various systems. It's not like uh, we are not doing this, you know, like we are not uh, controlling uh, diseases or we are not controlling some um, plants which are not to be grown. It's this uh, systems which are ecosystems which is run by these animals. So there is a massive decline of this species all over the world. And like from 68 to 25% decline is seen in various species. Some of them are able to sustain this. Some areas like Germany, where the data is good, you see the right side graph from Germany, it's like complete collapse. 75% of insects, biomass and uh, uh, species have completely got terminated in Germany. Now. Same thing is happening all over the world. So why do we need these insects? Because 90% of pollination is done by insects. Uh, unfortunately, we need, um, uh, we have become so capitalist in approach that everything we want to put a number, we want to put a figure to understand what is the value of different species. But it's very sad. They should be probably protected for what they are. I mean, beautiful, amazing uh, creatures which have taken the forces of evolution to make them. So 90% of our plants are pollinated by insects. Only 8% are done by wind, only 1% by vertebrates, and 1% does itself. So in term, in words of E.O. Wilson, uh, humans would not survive even more than a few months without these insects. So if insects are declining, there is a serious problem which is facing the humans. Uh, for example, this is a strawberry, which is 
the leftmost is uh, pollinated by insects. The rightmost is pollinated by hand. The centermost is uh, like the center one is pollinated by self, like tree itself is doing it by wind or whatever. So uh, you see, there is a huge decline, and this fruit production goes. Uh, believe me, we are, won't be able to survive. So if you go to a supermarket, all the fruits you are seeing, some bees or some insects have done this. You know, like they have got the special devices to do this, which we cannot. So, uh, for example, uh, some flowers are pollinated by special butterflies, which have these mandibles, which, 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 which is like this uh, uh, long proboscis, which goes down. And uh, these are like, for example, this bumblebee, it is evolved with the system such a way that no other, not many other species can go and pollinate this, you know, because these are, this is called as co-evolution. They both have come together. Like it took millions of years to figure out uh, this, this particular small uh, thing, which is coming out from bumblebee's mouth, which to suck the nectar, uh, it, it, it has taken millions of years to figure out or um, uh, other species like bees and black thorns and in India, there are around 700 species of bees, which are described here. Only five are used for honey, of which only two are the major ones, which we are using. We see uh, bees only from the perspective of honey. We think that honey is one. Yeah, but if you see honey is only 1% of what they're giving uh, the humans, you know, like not even 1%. So every buzzing, crawling, hovering insect is a cog and ecological machine. It's like a tiny individual effort that adds to the closer benefit of the planet Earth. And they all kind of, these are our actual nuts and bolts, which is making our spaceship fly, you know, which is making our spaceship survive. They, they are silently doing this service. If they are not there, this is in China. They're actually pollinating uh, the peers, the uh, peer using uh, artificial pollination. Imagine how difficult this lady has to go to each and every flower and do it. It's completely unsustainable. And unfortunately, our Himachal Pradesh apples are also getting pollinated by this, you know. The size of apples is going down because of this pollination. There are no bees. So with the decline of bees, uh, it, it's, it, it's just not bees in uh, Americas and um, Europe's. They are actually introducing bees. They are getting bee boxes and all that. There's a solution for everything they think. And then they bring uh, a lot of bee boxes. They're breeding them inside and all that. But you can do only this much, you know, only you can do only 20% of the work. But you need all the other species because if you really want to help the entire systems to work, you need all the other species. For example, when we colonized Afri uh, uh, Australia, we also took our cattle there because we need uh, meat, we need uh, milk, we need the whole dairy industry, we can't survive without that. So when we took there, uh, Australia was getting dumped, literally dumped by the pats of uh, dung of cattle, you know. The cattle was, the, there was no insect to take rid of uh, uh, this dung because Af Australia was isolated from Gondwana long ago. So there was no species which, uh, th there is no large mammal like this. And the cattle dung was not being uh, so, uh, recycled because there was no insect to uh, recycle that. So they had to introduce dung beetles from Africa and India and uh, South Asia. And they introduced some 23 dung beetles and um, this is a the pocket guide of dung beetles of Australia, which has been introduced from there. And now they say they have naturalized. And the introduction of dung beetles, uh, people were saying that, oh, they, this will bring a lot of other ecosystem problems and all that. But at least um, the cattle dung was being synth uh, uh, synthesized or like uh, used. Uh, not just that. All the fish you see in the water, in the fresh waters mainly, depend on insect larvae, like largely depend on. As they are small, the dependency are more. As they grow bigger, the dependency may get less. And entire bird life, which depends on these small bees. So although so how insignificant they look, they are like doing such great service. Coming 
to big forests, they make fruits from the trees, which gives food for monkeys. And this is a dry season, wherein monkeys, uh, you know, the association of um, langur and cheetal, they call uh, the deer and the monkey. There's Panchadantra stories about that, deer and the monkey. Basically, monkeys go and feed on the trees and the lean period, this grass is not palatable. It's all gray, it has a lot of silica, they can't eat it. So. Uh, these monkeys will drop a lot of fruits down and then a lot of animals, I mean, uh, herbivores get the food from that. So this fruits is being done only by the insects and both of them become the food of the tiger. So if you see, if you want to have a healthy population of deer, you need the systems to work and whole ecosystem should work and a healthy population of deer only will have a healthy population of tiger. So you need the whole system. We generally don't look at that and we can't protect animals outside that. So those dark areas which I showed are actually the beautiful areas of India. They are not uh, only beautiful, they are actually providing so many services to our country. So they have tremendous diversity being just 2% of the world, we still have around 13% of the birds, around 7% of uh, herbivores and 25% of large carnivores and huge variety of diversity of life, around 13 species of birds, 280 species of snakes, 400 species of mammals and 15 species of cats, of which tiger is the biggest. Uh, this all sustained through whatever Indus Valley civilization until now, until what we're seeing now is like only because of our cultural ethos, you know, because we worship nature, we respected nature, and we had all the you know, values for the nature, which is fastly going down. Now, there is no virtue in saving any forest from a religious perspective. It's only a few areas which are sacred growth, but rest of the country, I mean, we are not saving them. And uh, with advent of uh, industrialization and also with British in India, we first started taking away the forest and converting into agriculture fields and left the tigers uh, uh, with no food. And then tigers started coming to human uh, habitats and killing uh, livestock or dogs. And then in retaliation, they get killed. So this is... Uh, real image in uh, somewhere in Central Indian forest, you can see uh, there is nothing down on the ground. It's very dry, lean uh, period. In, and, and this period, you need, if it needs food, tiger needs deer, and deer needs some fruits which are falling from the trees. So they need monkeys. Monkeys need some insects, and insects need a healthy system to survive. There are tigers in Dubai also. Uh, this particular tiger is just hanging out from window. So ecologically, this tiger has no value. It, it, it is like completely dead. I mean, it has no significance ecologically. It's not that because this is a beautiful kutty little cat, we need to conserve it. We need to conserve it because of the ecosystem services which tiger gives. Uh, we have lost around 93% of uh, the tiger habitat in the world. Do you see this yellow? These are with the all habitats of the tiger within the last uh, 50 to 100 years. We have lost all the habitats. Although there is this current range, but go and go by this because entire Southeast Asia is empty. Most of it is empty. There is like uh, no, no animals inside. There's massive hunting. So India still holds 60% of the world tiger population. So now why tigers? Like um, I won't talk about tiger ecology here. Uh, but to just say it needs um, around 50 deers every year to survive because it needs 50 deers, a tiger needs 50 deers. It needs a base population of 500 so that each year it gets a crop of 50. It can crop 50 and then uh, still the thing is intact. So entire habitat um, of uh, the home range of tiger is defined by number of deers in its area. So the larger packing of deers in areas, smaller the home ranges, lesser the number of deers, it may have to spread out to cover that 50 deers in a year. So they also 
uh, live, uh, I mean, this is a male, it, it has three, four females around it. There's a transient which comes and goes. So you need to know a little bit of tiger ecology to protect it. So how do you go and protect it, protect the tiger? So first, you need to know what is the territory of tiger. It's, it's generally they live in forest and uh, this forest gives you tremendous ecosystem services. The ecosystem services are the services like the fresh water, fresh, the air which we breathe or the water we drink. Around 300 rivers originate from these tiger habitats in India. You know, like even though we have around 50 tiger reserves, but they are having major catchment areas for 300 rivers of India. Name any river, big river, they will have tiger areas around it. And this is how the ecosystems were originally established itself. And uh, originally, this is how it works. So there is studies from Indian Institute of Forest Management, which shows that each tiger reserve for, uh, gives us more than uh, some 2,000 crore each year as the benefit. And they say average for one rupee spent for tiger conservation, you get uh, ecosystem service worth of 2,500 rupees. So for some areas, it is around 7,500 rupees. So which investment gives you? So if you invest in tiger conservation, actually you're investing in conserving of forest. That forest will give you services, which are like water, pollination. They are home for billions of uh, bees and uh, thousands of other animals. So you are getting a complete system. So these are the different uh, ecosystem services which we get from the tiger forest. So these are the tangible benefits in crores from each tiger reserve and all that. I, I'm not going to get into this now. So these are the numbers which you have to go and talk to government and say, oh, these are the tiger reserves uh, giving to you each year. Now, uh, imagine uh, if you put all of this together, it will be more than our GDP, a lot more than our GDP. But we are not even quantifying this as the, the, the uh, any uh, value which we have from our nation. That's why we are not protecting. It's all not great inside the tiger reserves. They are also people living in on this tiger reserve. They are kind of landlocked. They are surrounded by forests. Okay, they have been living in harmony with nature earlier, but now they need basic amenities. This is lack because they are in forest. There is no incentive for making a road to the government for only 50 hertz of a village. You can't spend a crore rupees for, or like five crore rupees for 50 hertz because that's not, I mean, we have many other uh, things to do and these uh, people live in abject poverty inside. These are the tribes in central India. These are the Chenchu tribes which are living in uh, Nalamala forest. Uh, these are the original habitants of inhabitants of our continent uh, in India. And uh, now they are living in that uh, conditions. And uh, they also aspire. They also have a little um, aspiration. They also want school. The school building, for example, was made some 50 years ago, 40 years ago. It's not been repaired and it can fall any day. So this is the only school in the uh, in a village in Adilabad in uh, northern Telangana. And this is leading to massive migration of tribals from inside the forest to uh, uh, urban areas and they are looking for daily wages and they are doing some simple work. Earlier they were living in complete harmony. They were harvesting the uh, non-forest produce from the forest and they were like uh, living a very sustainable life. But now uh, because their population is also growing, they need more land for agriculture. They are clearing the forest and also other people around the forest are clearing the forest and we need more food, more people, more bellies to feed. Not only that, we have these development projects which are like completely blind. They are like climate blind, they are forest blind, they are tiger blind, they're blind for anything. But so in the name of development, we are submerging. It's very easy to do this, you know, like there were like some, uh, 30 Chenchu uh, hamlets on the other side of the dam. This is Sri Salam Dam in Andhra, Telangana border. There are 30 hamlets which have been completely thrown out and then forests submerged and we made a dam for making hydroelectric power, which we make only two months in a year. 
and we have managed to submerge so much. So also people living inside the forest are in com uh, uh, mostly they are in conflict with nature, uh, with the uh, wildlife all the time. Uh, there will be herbivores which are uh, coming in their fields and uh, damaging the crop because it's like, um, the crops are like uh, very lucrative. It's like a uh, supermarket or Monday, which is available all the time for uh, these animals to come and eat. So nutrients and everything is all in one bunch. So they come and eat. Um, sometimes cattle uh, are taken by the tigers or leopards. So uh, there is a lot of conflict in these areas. And who suffers? Generates a wildlife which suffers. Uh, the, this particular leopard was electrocuted uh, by, uh, because uh, farmers were using electric fences around uh, their uh, fields. Live electricity was put in this, 11 kV live electricity is put around this. So that whenever uh, any herbivore comes in contact or try to enter the field, it dies. So sometimes carnivores also dies. And uh, similarly, we have uh, poisoned uh, around 90 to 97 to 99% of our vultures, which is giving us a lot of other ecological problems. We are developing tourism, which is like completely mindless. We are making uh, lodges and homestays or like uh, this canopy walks and all that inside without even considering uh, nature. We just want to make money. Or we are also going for this um, alternative source of livelihoods, you know, like, uh, sorry, not livelihoods, energy development. So alternate forms of energy. Generally, we think that this energy development is, um, which is solar energy or hydropower comes with a halo, you know, like they think, oh, this is beautiful. And this is like, we are doing, uh, beating the uh, conventional ways of electric, uh, production of electricity by doing this but we are actually taking away a lot of habitats for doing this you know so uh, this was uh, in andhra pradesh india uh, so world's one of the largest solar farm which is uh, made uh, by a company which is marketed as green co uh, which is basically doing um, in the name of conservation uh, i mean uh, alternative source of energy but they are actually taken away habitat for bustards this entire place was a large grassland, you know. This has been taken away. This solar thing is great, but why don't we do it on rooftops? Why there is no subsidy for doing it on rooftop, big time subsidy? And why this large farms don't come up in Bangalore, Bombay, Hyderabad? So that's something which we have to ask. And um, this is what is happening. All our natural systems are getting completely hammered. And because this doesn't look like forest, it is not classified as forest and it's not protected. So this uh, bustards, there are only some 50 to 100 birds. This is the largest flying bird in the world, you know. And uh, this is called as Great Indian Bustard. You have uh, only 50 to 100 birds left. And as a country which is aspiring to be the fastest growing country and um, it's like the large emerging economy, we are not able to conserve this bird. It's very, very bad, very shameful actually. So, what do we do when you don't know what to do? Because yeah, problems are many. They're like everywhere. And where do we start? So when I started uh, thinking about tiger conservation, the idea was not tiger itself, you know, like the idea was to conserve forest. And there is no better excuse to conserve forest than tiger because tiger has legislation behind it. Tiger has a law which is supporting it. Tiger reserves can be legally made. I can't make a butterfly reserve or I can't make a bee reserve or anything, no matter what. But tigers have that attention. There's every parliament session, there's a question on tigers, you know. So um, and th this attracts so much attention. So why not tigers? Because tigers are living in a large forest. And as I told you, they need a lot of herbivores. And these herbivores are actually uh, basically needing a lot of forest. And while we're doing it, we are doing it. Coming back um, to this, there are the different types of ecosystems that tigers have found, of which India has the, um, all the three, except for maybe taiga and boreal forest. Um, we have moist deciduous forest, alluvial. But when we go there, there's like tremendous 
problems out there you know there are fires there are like uh, people dependency they are desperately poor and they like they want to cut the tree and this year they want to make this money uh, by taking the uh, the uh, forest produce because next year if they don't cut it and take it next year they may not uh, have that tree somebody else will do it so there's like complete over exploitation of resources there's large amount of cattle which is uh, actually munching away our forest and then we have this development projects which keep coming all the time to the forest so lot of loss of habitat so one major reason for declining tiger populations or that disappearing of that dark areas of india is because of loss of habitat other reason is poaching of prey which could be in the name of crop protection or which could be only for meat which could be for uh, pleasure hunting or it, it is uh, killing of tigers themselves this is although um, this looks like a big thing but actually it comes down the ladder you know actually losing habitat is the biggest problem for tigers they can sustain little bit of poaching but uh, they can't sustain loss of prey so what do we do when you pick up a forest uh, either we count tigers directly which is very expensive which is uh, maybe like in that entire area there may be only one tiger or two tigers which may not actually tell you what is the potential of that area and it's very expensive uh, other way around is we can estimate what is the prey densities so when we started the work i started with estimating prey densities in the, some parks to just say i know there was not many tigers there so the pitching for tigers won't be good so we started estimating prey so it will help us establish potential we can say that oh this forest can have 20 tigers so please help us protect mr mla uh, Man mantri ji um, let's protect this forest so uh, we can do all this when we have some assessment of the potential so we started with monitoring yeah we also started tiger counting slowly we are doing this in india's uh, largest tiger reserve now we are uh, covering around 6000 square kilometers of area each year for assessing the tiger numbers and the tiger prey we go in this forest we do a lot of wildlife surveys we have to find out where do we do put our cameras we need this camera traps to be put in the forest each tiger has a unique stripe pattern this stripe patterns are unique like our fingerprints so for taking the photos of these tigers and assessing how many tigers are there you need to go and find places where tigers would come so we'll go and assess the places and find out the areas map the thing and uh, put the cameras when we put the cameras we just not get tigers we get other species also like leopards and we get lots of images of other species and also tigers so we do some analysis called mark recapture which is like uh, we just mark the animal and say oh this animal we name it we give it a unique id and then we'll see how many times it has been recaptured we count prey by putting um, uh, imaginary lines in the forest uh, we just actually paint the trees and uh, there is a way to do that and we put transacts in the forest and then we walk those transacts count the prey we uh, for each uh, area we need around 600 to 800 kilometers of walk to come out with the number of how many sambars that area have or how many chital that area have so this is what we do this is small paint which just shows the way and we just go around the forest and walk and look at silently look at animals early in the morning and count them also we'll eliminate the threats like uh, we try to ask governments to put speed breakers on the roads or like um, reduce the speed of the roads or best not to have road here or we go and remove the snares which are put around to stop animals from grazing in the fields or like um, which are killing animals we remove those snares uh, we help the tribals uh, and we try to help them get the benefits of the government which is being provided to these tribals we work with at least four different tribe tribal populations uh, within uh, andhra and telangana we help forest department uh, by doing capacity building workshops for them and by taking them to field and teaching them we work 
with local communities, engage with them, understand their problems, try to address those problems. And basically we say that, please, this is very unsustainable. Don't cut the forest, don't burn the forest. Don't, uh, let's do something which helps you because this may give you a small benefit, but it may not really help survive. And your forest is so important for us as uh, everybody needs it. So we help, we go out, join monitoring with them and we ensure that no outsiders come and disturb the forest. We basically tell them that this forest belongs to you. There may be a forest department, but actually it belongs to you. You have been living it for thousands of years, hundreds of years. So let you only protect it, not uh, others come and disrupt it because you can't blame all the time others. So we help in law enforcement, we help in reducing hunting in those areas by doing uh, quick action by involving local people. We try to counsel this kind of people, try to help them rehabilitate. We try to get them different exercises. We do a little bit of uh, awareness sessions, education. We support the local voices. They bring their voices out, get the articles in the local newspapers. We help them ask for their rights. We help them ask for their um, um, resources so that they don't depend on forests, so that they move out from dependence on forests because it's not sustainable anymore. They are not going to live, have a good living with uh, only collecting NPFTs because everything is drying out, everything is um, getting decimated. Also, we work with politicians, you know, we go and create political will, we involve the local uh, MLA, two minister, two central ministers, and we try to influence them, we try to convince them we work with leadership, we'll tell them that conservation is a good way of living and you, you please don't oppose a sanctuary being made or tiger reserve being made. So this is very important step when you're actually working on making protected areas because protected areas generally are seen as something which is very exclusionist, which are throwing people out from the forest. So we, we don't believe in that model of uh, conservation. We believe in, in uh, inclusive model where we work with people. So a lot of advocacy, which uh, uh, leads to some action. And this is generally what we tell uh, the kids, why tigers and how can you help? Uh, how can you protect tigers? So uh, I wouldn't put my numbers and all that out, like what uh, areas we are doing and all that, but I can just say that you can learn more about us and join our effort. Uh, this is not to, call for volunteers. I'm not doing this for calling for volunteers. I'm trying to tell you that uh, these are the ways you can actually approach a problem and uh, uh, get into it and then do it. It could be seascapes, it could be landscapes, it could be riverscapes, it could be anything, you know, it could be species specific, it could be uh, landscape specific. So I think this, uh, this is the way I have, I have figured out to work on. Uh, at least you can be part of um, promoting, helping us by giving a good feedback and good likes and um, giving good uh, suggestions. So I always believe that, that you can either take responsibility or feel victimized by the world. This is what Joan Ruth has uh, told in Africa and she was shot, but I think she fought hard. So our work is in progress. So we got some areas completely without tigers. Now there are 12 to 15 tigers in Kawal Tiger Reserve, which we were, very crucial in making, we, we played a very key role in making the tiger reserve. Uh, our work, uh, uh, we have seen that tigers have increased from 30 to 16 Nagarjuna Sagar system tiger reserve. We got a lot of areas added to tiger reserves or um, in, uh, included in uh, existing tiger reserves uh, or declared as new. Uh, we support around 300 families in their livelihoods. We um, reduce our work help in reduce poaching, encroachment, in improving uh, sustainable livelihoods, uh, in capacity building of people, skill development, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So this is what I have to say. I think I'm open for questions. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much, Imran. That was wonderful. I think what was very important, which I think uh, I'm sure a lot of people appreciated in this was the fact that, as you said, a tiger is a very charismatic species. 
But what people don't realize is that it's at the top of the pyramid. When you save the tiger, you're not actually saving the tiger, you're saving the entire ecosystem, which falls under the tiger, which is all the herbivores, all the insects, all the plants, and so much more, right? And this is what we have also been trying to fight for in the ocean by protecting the sharks. You know, unfortunately now, the difference is that tigers are, of course, every, everybody's love, favorite love. It's the national animal and everybody wants to protect it, except, of course, the people who lose their cattle to it or who come into conflict with it. But in, this, in the ocean, a lot of people actually just believe that a good shark is a dead one. And this is really, really, really sad part of... Uh, the conservation of sharks, uh, it's very hard to convince people why you need to protect them and save them, you know? But I see so much of similarity between what you said uh, when you were talking about the entire ecosystem as compared to what we also see underwater. Now, sadly, underwater, everything is out of sight and out of mind. So it makes the challenge even more difficult, right? But on the other hand, there are not that many people there, although fishing pressures are there. So that makes it a whole different ball game altogether. So let me go to the first and only question. Rutika is asking what sort of what form of producing energy would be safer for wildlife? I think uh, anything which is produced locally and consumed locally so that there are not much losses in transmission. Like for example, if we do, uh, uh, I mean, village, we have seen that uh, energy solutions for heating, uh, which could be for cooking or for um, boiling water or something is the most important. Otherwise they have hardly an impact. So uh, in the local areas. So I think if we can do solar in that areas, it will be great. In uh, larger areas, I think it's very difficult to run solar and like, air condition and all that. So I think producing energy, yeah, definitely solar is good, but I think not at the expense of bustards or um, at the expense of uh, natural systems. So I think uh, that is something we need to really take care. So um, solar is best, I think, but done outside the natural system. Okay, I have a question for you. How long yeah. have you been doing this? Uh, 20 years. Okay. What makes you get up in the morning and gives you that positivity to go out and continue the fight? Because we are all in this game and to varying degrees, there are good days and there are bad days, obviously. But there has to be something that, you know, motivates you even today after 20 years of having dealt with corrupt politicians, corrupt officials, uh, a battle you lost here, a war you won there, you know, you know what I'm saying. So how do you keep yourself motivated and so positive? I think it's very depressing. Uh, this whole conservation is something which uh, you see more battle lost uh, or you see the flip side, and if you see even the presentation which I was talking, I was talking about more negatives which is happening. And there's hardly any positives to show. And that is the reality of the world, of the world out there. And it is so difficult. Um, and I think uh, what keeps me going is um, daily, I, actually sometimes what happens is uh, I don't have, like, I feel like I don't have time to, how will this night pass out? And, and uh, when will the sun come out and when can I go out and do what I have to do? So, but it's, I don't know, it, it's like extreme uh, depression or it's like a positivity which is uh, making me feel like that. I don't know what it is, but it sometimes you feel like, oh man, you have to sleep also and get up and go. But I think that's not every day. Every day, I think it's, um, uh, it's uh, new, new challenges which we see and there's always a list a bag of things which is pending. Like for example, when you talk about sharks, I want to really put the sharks into protected uh, schedule one species in um, 
at least the whale shark at least whale shark is there i think at least a few sharks but uh, but that's not happening you know like so i think that is something and every day um, for tomorrow i have some new challenges which i um, want to address and uh, i think i go home thinking or uh, about those challenges and like get restless before I sleep i don't know if it's a good practice or not but um, next morning i'm so eager to go out and attack that yes i think we have all the all have those days um i'm i'm uh, i mean of course uh, even i get depressed with all the news and the statistics that are being thrown you know but to me the most depressing thing that i find is i'm sure you found it as well if you're writing a pro project proposal for example to protect let's say the bees the first question that gets asked is how does that help us how does that help the human race we are so egocentric and we are so you know kind of everything has to be seen as something benefiting us directly otherwise it has no economic value that's what was coming through again to me when you were showing all these numbers about how much every reserve means in terms of rupees who cares at the end of the day it is helping us save it is help every individual we are taking a breath and that is coming out of the forest and that is coming out of the oceans all the oxygen that we breathe is being supplied by these two in ecosystems you know and that should be enough by itself it is our survival that is being uh, that is in question that is being uh, funneled by all these ecosystems and organisms and insects and birds and bees and what have you and we have totally lost sight of that we have lost sight of the fact that living in the cities we are so disconnected from uh, uh, all the forests from all the wildlife it's really sad that we have come to this and that in as you said in 4 uh, seconds or what was it 4 minutes of our being on the planet we have actually threatened the very extinction of the planet and all the other animals that have lived on it but i do believe there is hope i'm sure you do as well and that's why we are fighting this battle oh. i'm doing in a different uh, ecosystem you are doing it in a different but it doesn't matter we all working together you see the, i mean if you get down in africa you see oh, it looks like india only and if you go to see it seems like it oh, looks like tiger conservation only so i think everything is uh, somewhere related and yeah very similar ultimate yes. end goal is very similar but i think uh, i used to think as a child oh i have born a touch late i should have born say 100 years ago by reading all those uh, books and magazines jim jim corbett and um, kenneth anderson but as i grew up i think now i feel very like this is the generation this is the only generation which actually can make a difference you know like we are in a very pivotal generation we are born after this industrial revolution after 50s so most of us are after 50s born so i think uh, we have this opportunity which uh, uh, had i born 100 years ago i would have been maybe um, not even appreciating uh, seeing a tiger or seeing a bird because it was so abundant and common but i think now i can appreciate that and also my life has some value now otherwise it would have been a life for like many others you know, with, without even appreciating without even doing anything i think now i feel so privileged that i have a life wherein i can i can fight each day Uh, i asked my friends in netherlands uh, they say that we don't have issues like you have in india you know like they protest for small small things they protest they come on board and protest for small things which is so insignificant for us for us there are real battles out there to go and fight so i think it makes me um, really proud to be fighting this battles and i hope i keep doing that successfully absolutely i'm sure you will and i have absolutely no doubt that you will never give up this struggle and that is what makes this planet survive you know each and every one of us makes a difference so it's definitely something which you need to keep fighting for and uh, never give up uh, in the the war or the battle whatever you want to call it yeah there's a question so, 
yeah i think that was uh, yeah okay uh, anonymous attendee is asking large scale solar power plants are supposed to be set up on waste non agricultural lands as classified by the government is there an issue of misclassification of land also in your opinion how will the new environmental bill affect conservation oh that environmental bill is a very big question but i think um, uh, unfortunately we have not let go british out of india after british left also so all these classifications were done by british to exploit india so uh, they have put areas which have good peak forest as uh, high profile areas and like which have no um, uh, tree growth as waste lands and like degraded lands unfortunately we have not just come out from that you know that classification we still follow the forest act is 1927 we still uh, have uh, that visions even uh, the recent document on reduction of uh, red plus uh, uh, degradation of forest and getting carbon credits from that says grasslands is out of its ambit uh, they are mentioning grassland even the blue carbon is out of their ambit because it is not described in our forest act you know so it's very sad it's very sad that we are not uh, protecting these areas which are so important in their own way because they are so vast and, uh, in their own way they are sequestering carbon uh, to large extent and they are so important for uh, the ecosystems to survive and yet they are badly classified and environmental uh, bill uh, i think is meaning to uh, the question is about environmental impact assessment uh, dilution uh, which is happening uh, with the recent uh, things it's not just that all the acts are systematically been uh, diluted so i think it is very sad there's a long um, um, thing to it but i think that's going to make the industry easy that we all we talk about that single window clearances and all that is going to be much uh, easier although now 98% of the projects are getting passed i think it will be 100% so i think it's very sad the way it is happening and also there won't be any safeguards uh, after that like uh, there was a principle called polluters pay principle like wherein if you are distracting so much and then you actually uh, put so much uh, back by put, uh, putting two times of the worth or uh, five times of what you are distracting so th th this all is going to get uh, affected and some of the things have uh, no in environmental impact so to be done like expansion of coal areas it's ridiculous it is like anybody can take permission now and keep expanding and they don't need any special permissions no matter which habitats they are going to take so i think uh, but i am sure our media is very sharp and our government is really looking into it and uh, courts are very active so i am sure this is not going to get through easily i think the point is that you know uh, you and i are well more me more than you we are fighting at the front line you are also an influencer within the government and that is very important so you need different people fighting different battles at different fronts to make a difference at the end of the day you need law makers you need policy changers you need uh, front line staff so you need everybody to join hands work together and only then we can hope to save this and salvage this okay so yeah i think um, i'll just end on this note i always believe that um, see uh, if i coming from a middle class background from a sleepy hyderabad city from uh, old city of hyderabad which is muslim dominated and which is having um, very uh, different culture and if i am going and doing a little bit of work if i can do i think everybody of us can do because everybody of us have uh, 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 they are a great resource in themselves so that is something we need to believe oh what can i do oh you are better place you are on government get um, this thing oh you are something no you don't need to be that you can be a doctor you can be engineer but still you can do it and uh, you have to just identify what you can do i think my point is like everybody is a great resource you don't yes. i mean if you are coming from village we need so many people from villages actually all these urban people yeah. are talking about conservation but the rural people are not if you are coming from coastal side we need so many people from coastal areas you know like yes. so we, we need everybody from all spheres so it's not like a job which is cut for somebody you know
Very true. Very true. Well said. That has to come from here. Yeah. It has to come from passion, yeah. not from here. Yeah. And that is what makes all the difference. So, yeah, I've talked to so many people in the you know fields, and all of them have the same thing in common. They they have to have a passion. So Maithili is asking, how can someone who hasn't studied conservation help in conservation? Well, I think uh, uh, you can start by studying a little bit. And I think uh, you can actually, uh, there's, now we are in the era of information, you know, everybody can connect to anybody. So in a way, it's like you can get in touch with people like Venkat or like uh, somebody who's working in conservation. And uh, I, I think uh, I tell, I don't know what uh, volunteers come to me and say, oh, I want to do something for this. I don't know what something I can put you to. Mm -hmm. It's not that I need your uh, thing. I need your thing, but you should come with your Swiss knife, Swiss knife. You should say that these are my skill sets. I'm a software professional, you know. So great, we need that. And everybody has something to contribute. You may be anything. You may be a tailor. We need those tailors to train people to have a sustainable livelihood. So you may be anything, uh, we need those. And especially people who are actually um, educated and who uh, can speak a language, write a language, which is universally accepted. I think you have a greater thing. You can reach out on social media and all that. I think you can do a great contribution. So I think the best way to start is joining with these groups. Now it's so easy. You can actually uh, face, uh, join some Facebook groups or like um, you can follow some uh, existing um, avenues in Twitter or Instagram. I mean, you can share share something. You can start there. But I think uh, the best way is to join some group and be with them for some time. I think right. you'll get your answer. I think you've already answered the second question. She says, how, if someone wants to learn more, what are the avenues? Yes. I think you've already answered that. Yes, yeah, my but, is see, Doing an MSc course or doing a PhD and all that could be the ultimate thing, but not everybody uh, can do. I mean, we have one lifetime and you are actually maybe selected something for your life. It will be so difficult to jump there. And you have families, you have everything to support. So I think it takes time, but uh, you can do it. Yeah. I think everybody can do it. Yeah. yeah. Of course, and the, uh, as you correctly said, there are so many different people, different organizations who are there already doing good work. And if you spend a little bit of time in researching, you'll find your uh, the person or the subject that you want to work with. And you can always connect with them. And then, uh, of course, they'll also guide you. But you must also do your own research, I think, in whatever field you want to work in. Because what is one person's battle may not be another person's battle, but doesn't have to be. We can all find our own thing that we are interested in. And as long as you find that within your heart, and follow that, I think that's the best solution, right? Right, I think we don't have any more questions unless somebody wants to jump in and ask something more. And um, so we have to thank you for your time thank and you. uh, your patience in giving us all this informative information and making us see why the bee is as good or as important, if not more than a tiger. I think that was very, very important. That was a very useful message that you passed on to the people today. Uh, so thank you so much. And thanks SSI for this platform as usual. And uh, we'll say bye for now and please join us for the next webinar. All right, take care, yeah. good night. Thanks everyone for listening, thanks.